and I'm going to start us off. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. I'm Lisa Shipek, Executive Director here at Watershed Management Group, and joined by some other staff, Kat Lo Shipek and Lauren Monheim, um, who will be helping out today. Uh, Lauren will be providing some tech support and monitoring the, the chat to help respond to questions and comments there. And Kat and I will be kind of swapping slides and presenting. We'll definitely want to uh, leave time for Q&A and uh, we can take questions as we go as well. So feel free to put questions in the chat, um, to, to raise your hand um, and we'll get those questions answered. We're also just interested to hear your opinion. Hopefully some of you've had the chance to at least look at the One Water Plan. I know it's a little intimidating, it's over 100 pages, um, but if you've had a chance to look at it or skim it, um, interested in hearing your opinion and what your thoughts are as well. So we wanted to take the opportunity to um, present on our perspective on what uh, we're seeing in the plan, how it relates to watershed management groups work and our vision for the watershed. Uh, we have a fun little graphic here we developed um, on uh, what it looks like to be hydro local and these concepts or um, complementary hydro local, one water, um, a watershed framework. These are all kind of related uh, concepts that uh, that complement each other. Uh, we've got the link there, but we can drop the link in the chat too for where the one water plan is. And um, we will go on to the next slide. like to start by acknowledging that we live, learn, work, and engage with the community on the ancestral lands of the Hohokam, Sabaipuri, Apache people, and those of the Pascua Yaqui and the Tohono O'odham, whose relationship with the land continues this day and continued stewardship with those indigenous groups today. We acknowledge that water is sacred and that the water in the Sonoran Desert has great spiritual, physical, and ecological significance to be protected, cherished, and celebrated. And we'd like to see more of that um, highlighted in this One Water Plan. Next slide. So the Santa Cruz River watershed is the watershed we fall in. This map shows where Tucson is in that watershed. Um, the blue uh, river there is the Santa Cruz River, uh, starts in Arizona, dips down into Mexico, back up uh, through Nogales, coming up um, into Tucson and continuing on to Casa Grande. Uh, the Santa Cruz River feeds into the Gila River and eventually the Colorado River. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, you see a logo on these two slides from the Santa Cruz Watershed Collaborative. Uh, WMG, uh, along with over 30 other organizations, are part of this collaborative. And some of the concepts we're going to be talking about come from the Santa Cruz Watershed Collaborative's restoration plan. So we're going to be referring to that. And we've got a link to that here on the slide. We can also drop that in the chat. That's another resource for you. Uh, this plan was collaboratively developed. Uh, with all those partners, um, <clears throat> ranging from local, regional, national governments to a variety of nonprofits like ours, to partners um, like the University of Arizona and uh, the San Javier District of the Tohono O'odham Nation. So um, this is a great resource to think about, and we'd like to see more of some of the concepts that are in this plan in the One Water Plan as well. Next slide. Uh, this is a little bit hard to see on your computer screen, but just wanted to give a quick look at um, some of our heritage of flowing creeks and rivers in this area. We have a map on the left that shows um, <clears throat> areas that used to be perennial and intermittent or seasonal flows. The perennials are the dark blue, the seasonal are the mid-level blue, and then there's also um, some shallow groundwater areas highlighted. The map on the right shows how that's changed to that's close to present day. 
where we have lost some of these perennial and seasonal flow areas due to groundwater pumping and, and poor development practices. However, there still are some. So we wanted to make sure that people can see that we still do have some perennial and seasonal flows, shallow groundwater areas that support these. And we're working to restore and bring back more of those groundwater levels so we can see more of those flows again. So on the map, um, we have, uh, I don't know who was doing the pointer, if that was Catlo, uh, the Sabino Tanka Verde area, if you could kind of circle that, it's a really important area. We have the Sienega Creek area, Rincon Creek area. Um, and we'll be talking more about that. So let's go ahead and go on to the next slide. I think I'm passing it on to Catlo now. Yeah, thanks Lisa. Good to see everybody. Um, thank you for your interest. So I'm gonna jump in to a lot of the 2100 One Water Plan focuses on supply and demand, specifically for Tucson. Um, but we always like to start with the watershed and think about that in context along with our other water providers across the region. Uh, this is a water supply and demand chart for the Tucson Active Management Area, which uh, goes beyond just Tucson water. It does include a lot of other larger water suppliers um, and users. And so the on this right side are the demands. And what we're focusing largely on, um, specifically here in Tucson and even a lot of our other residents across, is the municipal side. So looking at um, our current demands and then our current supplies. And the reason there's this X here is largely over 80% of our current supply for Tucson is being supplied from the Central Arizona project. Um, and we're not as good at utilizing a lot of our local on-site water supplies that are local to our watershed. So the question we've been uh, um, working on is how do we reduce our demand on the Central Arizona project largely so we can restore our own watershed and our rivers, but not at the expense of the Colorado River. So thinking about how do we shift to being hydro local, um, enhancing local supply, reducing demand, and thinking about reuse. So jumping into specifically, this is a graphic from uh, Tucson Waters 2100 plan. On the water production side, uh, we have 1940 on the left to 2022 on the right. So you can see that overall demand has grown and peaked out in uh, early 2000s and then since has been declining a bit. But it was around that time period that we also shifted from mining groundwater to importing Colorado River water. And so that's given our aquifers a little bit of a repeat, reprieve and chance to start to uh, rebound a little bit. We've also started to diversify our water resource portfolio so uh, with recycled water, remediated groundwater, and then even lately is starting to think about how do we add stormwater to our water supply portfolio. On the demand side, uh, interestingly, so I think over 90% of our uh, Tucson water demand is from the residential sector. Uh, oh, here we, sorry, I have it, the percentages right here. 93% of the demand is single family. If we add in multifamily, duplex, triplex, uh, we're getting, uh, you know, that's the majority of the pie right there. So uh, largely it's thinking about then what can we as residents do at our own home for reducing those demands and at the same time enhancing supplies of uh, rainwater, stormwater, recycled water, et cetera. And so, uh, a lot of this comes to, you know, what can we do at home? Uh, what are some of the efficiencies, some of the behaviors, but then also how do we become hydro-local stewards of our water supplies? So thinking about what does it mean to be hydro-local? So currently our uh, current Tucson residential average use is on this left side, is around 80 gallons per person per day. And that's broken out for average daily use per person by toilet, showers, faucets, laundry, outdoor, leaks, et cetera, that combines to make that 80 gallons. So we're looking at to be hydro-local as a municipality um, within the Tucson Active Management Area, we need to reduce our residential use to 40 gallons per person per day. So 
we find this helpful for creating a target of, okay, here's where we're at. The benchmark is 80. How do we get to 40? And you can see it's not a huge shift to be able to cut demand in half. Um, it's a more efficient toilet, slightly more efficient showers, maybe shorter showers, uh, more efi efficient faucets, laundry, but the large savings is in the outdoor. And that's because we can shift easily to rainwater, stormwater, recycled water supplies uh, to minimize that outdoor demand, which overall also reduces our leaks to get us down to 40 gallons per person per day. So then thinking about the one water framework across our community, and this is where the 2100 plan um, really focuses in on is looking at that larger water supply portfolio and the demands across the different sectors. And so we're looking at, you know, regional recycled water. How do we value that? How do we distribute it? What do we use it for? Uh, to stewarding our rivers, uh, preserving floodplain for stormwater enhanced recharge, especially in our shallow groundwater areas protecting and valuing uh, groundwater for reducing contaminants, um, cleaning up from contamination and doing more uh, regional, um, you know, neighborhood scale rainwater harvesting, et cetera. Just wanting to paint some background picture of where we're at, where we've come from. So this is a map also from the plan of the last 20 years water level changes across the region. We can see that uh, the aquifer here has risen 239 feet. And this is because the Colorado River water is recharged into the Avra Valley Basin. It's then pumped and transported over to the Tucson aquifer or Tucson for demand use. However, because we've reduced our pumpage in the Tucson aquifer, it's allowed this local aquifer to rebound up to 70 feet in Midtown. Um, we do still have areas of decline in the southeast sector and the north, uh, northwest sector, and especially in the Ore Valley area. So this is, you know, it's not too bad. We have a good amount of water banked. We're reclaiming or restoring our local aquifer. But um, to me, I look at 71 feet. Oh, that sounds great. But look at where how much we've mined in the past. This is approximate decline in water levels from 1940 to 1995. So we have 200 foot decline and we've only recovered it at best 70 feet. So we still have a ways to go to recover and restore our local groundwater supplies. Not to mention Tucson Water has taken 22 wells off service because of PFAS, a perfluorinated compound contamination as well. Hey, Callow, there are a couple questions. If we could just pause for a second. Sure. If you could go back to the kind of the water budget, the 80 to 40 slide, Joaquin had a question. If, let's see, are those numbers to get to 40 addressed in the 100 year plan? So I can start and then Callow can round us out on that. Um, this is something that WMG has been advocating for for a number of years. Is getting us to 40 GPCD for the, the regional Tucson area. Um, it's not in Tucson Water's One Water Plan. Um, they talk about how GPCD gallons per person per day has gone down. And they talk about measuring that as a key indicator um, of success of their conservation measures, but they haven't set any targets. So that might be something to put in a comment to address is, is advocating that to some water, the greater community sets some targets on how low we do wanna go for our GPCD, um, because there is a lot more room for there, for that growth and, and reducing the water use. And so um, that would be something that, that could be a specific target that could be put into the plan. There was another question about, I'm gonna give this one to you, Catlow. Um, HOAs, let's see. I see that question from Jennifer. Um, yeah. How can folks in HOA communities controlled by builders advocate for rainwater harvesting 
So uh, this is where there is some headway with thinking about new development. How do we incorporate rainwater harvesting, low impact development, green infrastructure at the time of new development? Um, then there are incentives for existing development. However, there are still, as Jennifer mentioned, still rules against water harvesting. So that would then have to be taken to the state level. And much like there's a solar ordinance where an HOA can't ban solar, uh, there has been have been proposals uh, to do that similarly for water harvesting. However, it hasn't gotten out of committee. So that would be contacting at the state legislature level to work on that. The other option is uh, getting on the board and changing those rules too. <laughs> Not always an easy or fun process. Great. Any other questions? Should I? I think keep rolling. Just going to look at questions as they come in and see when it makes sense to, to address. Yeah. Okay. And there was just one question that just popped up. Um, just a clarification related to what we're going to be talking about here today. Um, Julie wants to know, we're learning resources and ideas in order to write more informed comments on the One Water Plan, right? Yeah, so the this first portion of the is just a presentation to kind of highlight some of the resources and some of the issues that we've been working on and then getting into the specifics uh, focused on the plan. Thank you, Kelly. So this slide uh, is focused on stormwater. So we talked a little bit about uh, groundwater. Now looking looking at the stormwater resource, we're going to be calling this out a little bit later on some specific suggestions. But it has been noted by Pima County Regional Flood Control District that we have 12 to 25,000 acre feet of year of new water supply produced by urban stormwater runoff. And so, and this is easiest to be captured um, at the lot to neighborhood scale. And so thinking about this as a new water supply that can be added to our portfolio, better utilized, but then the question is, what does it take to get there? Flood control has been doing some work on that, looking at even stormwater enhanced recharge. Where is it best in our basin to do that enhanced stormwater recharge, to recharge our groundwater or aquifer? So they've mapped out where there's uh, good soil porosity to where is the uh, stormwater volume that can be paired with an open space for floodplain uh, preservation or restoration. Uh, so this is just an example. Um, it kind of, it's a little bit cut out here, but in the Christmas wash watershed, since some of us are in the Christmas wash watershed, we have the potential of an additional 1,200 or 12,000 acre feet a year of stormwater enhanced recharge just in our own sub watershed. So I'll turn that back to you, Lisa. Okay, so um, we wanted to uh, provide a few concepts that we're going to referring back to as we talk about what's in the 2100 plan and our recommendations. And fundamental to what we're recommending is a 50 year vision that WMG has put forward to restore Tucson's heritage of flowing creeks and rivers. And that's partly what we were talking about earlier with the map, what we used to have historically, we'd like to see um, some of that restored, which we think is possible. Um, so this image is showing the Santa Cruz River and uh, we're looking at our creeks and rivers across the Tucson Basin. So Sabino Creek, Tango Verde Creek, Cienega Creek, looking at all these areas and how we can restore groundwater levels and heritage flows. Go ahead to the next slide. This image is looking a little bit more closely at the Tanka Verde Creek and where the Pantano Creek come into the Rito, an area in Tucson we've been fo focusing a lot of attention on. It is a shallow groundwater area. So groundwater is within 50 feet of the surface and it still has some areas with flows, seasonal flows, um, perennial flows in Lower Sabino Creek and support some really important riparian forests in this area. There's a number of things that we can all do. We'd like to see some of these things show up in the 2100 plan. So protecting natural floodplain from development. Um, there's a lot of encroachment on the floodplain through um, housing developments. 
uh, specifically restoring groundwater levels, not just protecting um, where they're at now, but bringing groundwater levels back up. Uh, that's through a, a number of things, including enhanced recharge. Um, and removing invasive Arundo is a, a thing we've specifically been working on, not anything Tucson Water would do per se, but something we're doing for ecosystem restoration that also helps restore the aquifer levels. Next slide. And just wanted to give a little background on shallow groundwater areas and how they relate to flow. So creeks and rivers in the desert will only be flowing year round if they're connected to groundwater. So this image shows how that works. You have a groundwater aquifer when it's high enough, it actually expresses itself on the surface as flows. This is uh, looking at the Tanca Verde area. We do have an area we're closely monitoring where we've seen some of these flows start to return because groundwater levels have started to come back up. So how we manage the watershed um, from a one water perspective is really important to protect these areas, to restore more groundwater, make sure we're not pumping too much from these areas as water utilities um, so we can help protect these flows. Let's go ahead to the next slide. So this idea of hydrolocal, we're asking how can we scale up all these efforts to steward our local renewable water resources instead of depleting distant watersheds and rivers and specifically the Colorado River. So let's go ahead to the next slide. So in the plan, Tucson Water has a vision and guiding principles, which we like. Um, we, we are, I just wanna say we are extremely pleased that Tucson Water is creating a one water plan. This is not something that all water utilities have. Tucson Water has been committed to shifting to a one water framework for a number of years. That's really excellent and we applaud them for that. I think we are hoping to nudge them a little bit along the way to um, really think about actions that support some of these guiding principles that they have. Specifically number three, uh, enhance the community's quality of life by preserving and restoring riparian areas including urban tree canopy and supporting economic growth. So this is in their guiding principle. However, we're not seeing actions that really do that locally. So that's what we're gonna point out. Next slide. Uh, Catlow, do you wanna touch on this slide? And then I'll do the next one. Sure. <clears throat> so we just, um, as Lisa mentioned, we applaud uh, City of Tucson, Tucson Water for developing a one water plan. Um, that in itself is just a great accomplishment. Uh, again, guiding principles number three and four, enhancing communities' quality of life and achieving social justice. Um, that's great to integrate into a more holistic planning framework. Uh, they have included green stormwater infrastructure. They've included climate projections and scenario planning. They have a number of selected strategies that they highlight, uh, chapters five and six. Uh, that go over the different supplies and demands for how to, for example, groundwater uh, strategies one through three, protecting aquifer, accelerating groundwater cleanup efforts, et cetera, recycled water to stormwater to incentives, mandates and measures to even education. So there's a lot of good stuff in this one water plan. And we just wanted to, I can go through this in more detail, but just you know, definitely give this uh, recognition. Next slide. Well, I wanna jump in here too. There are a few questions that okay. might have been answered with those guiding principles, um, but maybe not. Um, Dan wanted to know if development was something that can be addressed in this plan. Dan, can you be more specific with your question? Uh, his question is, is development something that, pe that can be addressed in the One Water Plan that really requires zoning changes which are external to Tucson Water? But should be addressed is the full comment. I can just give a, a short answer and maybe we can brainstorm a little bit collectively um, later, is thinking about what development is based on is a, a hundred year water supply. And so thinking about what is our 100 year water supply is that um, that's by state law, what is required? Could we go beyond that? A hundred years isn't that long uh, if we think about it. Uh, 
before we start mining again or, or extracting our other water supplies. And I have one more question. Um, does this plan um, also collaborate with other utilities like the Marana Water or Oro Valley Water and CAP? Yes, they have outlined collaborations with other, I mean, not in great detail, but they mentioned collaborating with other water utilities in the area as well as other agencies, uh, CAP, ADQ. Um, those things are definitely outlined in some of their strategies. So this slide, um, if you don't get anything else from today's presentation, this is what I want you to take away. So if you're like, hey, you know, some of this is a, a really beyond me, I'm, I'm new to this, I'm learning. Um, here are some things that I feel like you can sink your teeth in and write comments around without too much work. So um, we'll bookmark this slide for you. But what we really want to point out and, and hopefully here, Tucson Water can hear from some of our River Run Network members on this, is that um, there needs to be more specific actions on surface water and groundwater strategies. So under section 5.3.1, 6.1.1, which is surface water related, we need to add specific actions on how to protect and restore local surface waters like Sabino and Tanka Verde Creek, as well as the Rito and Santa Cruz rivers. And actually, I feel like we maybe skipped a slide as I'm saying this. No, the previous remember? slide was the strengths. Uh, what about the one with the framework? Where's, where's that slide? Is that next? I just put the framework up. Okay. I'm going to come back to that slide. I want to do this slide first. Sorry, I had it in the wrong order. Because um, this relates to some of my other points. So the other thing, uh, some overall observations with Tucson Waters framing in this one water plan. Uh, the plan is informed by Tucson water scenarios that they developed, which led to their community surveys. Um, their surveys, unfortunately, leave out riparian and groundwater restoration actions. Um, and this is a quote from the plan on page 16. This, the survey focused on supply and demand management strategies, as they were the areas identified as the most important and most uncertain in the scenario planning process. So they unfortunately didn't get some of these strategies we'd like to see in there even into the community survey. So they didn't even make it into the survey part. So they're not in the, just didn't even make it into the plan. Um, so we see that as a weakness of this plan and would like to see that changed. Um, the plan does not recognize that there are seasonal and perennial flowing rivers in the Tucson Basin. I think that's fundamental to shifting this framing. Um, a quote from page 41, the Tucson region is located along the Santa Cruz River and its tributaries. Prior to 1880, this was the primary water source for Tucson. With increasing development groundwater use increased leading, increased leading to declining groundwater levels, resulting in the disappearance of natural perennial surface water flows. So they're making a statement that essentially we don't have these perennial surface water flows anymore without recognizing that we do still have some in the Tucson Basin. So I think that's also a fundamental flaw in the way they've outlined their plan. Um, the plan pays lip service to the ecosystem benefits of their projects, like the Santa Cruz Heritage Project, without actions to actually enhance riparian ecosystem health. Quote from page 53, they talk about the Santa Cruz Heritage Project is an excellent example of how Tucson Water is committed to fit for purpose water resources for community and ecosystem benefits. And they talk about how it now fosters abundant native vegetation and wildlife. So um, Tucson Water, while we love that they put water back in the river, there's not been a concerted effort to do any ecosystem restoration with that project. So there are some wildlife that have returned and there are there is some vegetation, but there hasn't been any active efforts to do riparian restoration. And so um, we're feeling that that is also a missing piece where um, there's talk about it, but there's not really the actions to support it. 
Uh, the plan calls out the importance of collaboration between organizations in the community, but there are no specific strategies or actions to back this up. For example, uh, we mentioned the Santa Cruz Watershed Collaborative, the Watershed Restoration Plan, which was adopted in 2022. Tucson Water is a partner on the collaborative. They helped adopt that plan. The plan is never mentioned or referenced in the One Water Plan, even though there could be a lot of overlap here. So quote from page 19, talking about how the One Water approach is a, a new way of doing things, uh, integrated planning that fosters collaboration between organizations in the community. So we'd like to see that move beyond an, an idea to actual, um, actual specific references and strategies in the plan. All right, let's go back to that other slide. I know that was a lot there, so <laughs> I don't know if I should pause for a second. And we can also share these slides with everybody um, after we run through them. Okay, so going back to our recommendations, if you were to put them in a neat little package of like what we would feel is most impactful, is adding specific actions on how to protect and restore local surface waters. Sabino, Tanka Verde Creek, Rito, Santa Cruz, and beyond. And currently the plan only has actions related to the Colorado River surface flows. So whenever you see them mention surface water in the plan, they are only talking about the Colorado River water. So they're not even referring to any of the local surface flows. So that is, we see a fundamental flaw. Um, under sections 532 and 61, groundwater strategies, we would like to add actions to protect sensitive shallow groundwater areas, the areas we've outlined that are still within 50 feet to surface, to support our riparian ecosystems. And that's a priority for groundwater restoration. Uh, they don't have anything like that currently in the plan. Actions would include things like enhanced stormwater recharge near shallow groundwater areas, creating targeted conservation programs for people living in these shallow groundwater areas, and developing recycled water opportunities in shallow groundwater areas to enhance recharge and flow. Next slide. If this is you, Kalo. Uh, so separately, there's also the Tucson Climate or Tucson Resilient Together, which is the climate action plan that was developed with a separate set of consultants, contractors. From, but the Tucson Resilient Together plan references Tucson Water's One Water plan that was still in development. So the two plans cross-reference each other. However, but what I'm seeing is that there's not specific water sustainability or climate-related strategies in the One Water plan that really gets at uh, climate resilience. They do include climate uh, projections and climate scenarios but it doesn't specifically tie to climate resilience from a community health or environmental health perspective. Uh, there's a little bit in there about green infrastructure, um, but even then that doesn't tie specifically to heat island uh, for shade canopy, um, growing shade canopy with stormwater or chronic flooding uh, from stormwater uh, issues as well. So the One Water Plan really only focuses on supply and demand. It doesn't uh, fully address. And I think uh, somebody mentioned earlier about the carbon footprint of importing Colorado River water to Tucson. Um, not even sure that is addressed in the climate resilience uh, plan either. Uh, so the second piece of that is uh, they do reference the current drought response plan which is on page 70 of the 2100 plan. Uh, that drought response plan only has drought triggers that are linked to Lake Mead. Uh, so it doesn't include connections to our local groundwater levels or our seasonal rainfall. So if we're thinking about climate scenarios, climate resilience, we need to also consider our local climate and how that's impacting our local water supplies.
So these next couple slides have a long list of specific strategy recommendations, and largely these are taken from the Santa Cruz Watershed Collaborative Watershed Restoration Plan that was adopted in 2022. Uh, again, as I mentioned, I'm happy to share uh, that plan. I'm happy to share these slides because I know this is a lot of information that we're going through pretty quickly. And I believe there will also be a YouTube video that you're welcome to uh, review as well. But thinking about, so uh, Tucson Water and their 2100 plan have it broken into different supplies and demand strategies. And so the first one focused on surface water. So this is page 98 in the PDF. Uh, so some of our specific strategy recommendations is help protect, restore shallow groundwater areas and their corresponding historic and current surface flows, enhancing stormwater infiltration in arroyos and shallow groundwater areas, review and updating floodplain preservation policy to enhance floodplain infiltration for groundwater recharge opportunities, balance, not maximize, the benefits of our Colorado River allocation for Tucson with the health of the Colorado River itself. So right now the plan is very much focused on maximizing the benefits from receiving our imported Colorado River water without uh, fully recognizing what is what are the issues on the Colorado River and the Delta, Colorado River Delta itself. Um, and then supporting environmental flow, local policy development. So uh, a little bit of this has been done uh, a decade or more in the past with the conservation effluent pool that guarantees uh, in-stream flow of effluent, treated effluent in the Santa Cruz River be, um, downstream. And so thinking about how do we do more of that to enhance and preserve our riparian environments. I should mention on surface water, I looked um, at several other municipalities. Los Angeles has a whole chapter dedicated to uh, restoring, preserving the LA River as part of their one water plan. So this isn't abnormal. This isn't uh, something out of the blue. This is, um, I think, a, a two other municipalities I saw in the Western. So I tried to not include East Coast since it's more humid, but uh, West Coast communities and many of them do include uh, protections and enhancements of their local waters or local rivers. Thinking about groundwater strategies. So partnering with the Santa Cruz Watershed Collaborative to implement the Watershed Restoration Plan. This is a plan that uh, many different agencies, organizations, municipalities have come together to agree to work towards. So how do we bolster that within the city of Tucson uh, which is essentially the elephant in the room, right? Of uh, all the different jurisdictions. Working with water providers and other water utilities, uh, using groundwater to develop shortage sharing agreements. So recognizing there's many other groundwater users across our basin, not all connected to Tucson water. Some of them, some of them do have wheeling agreements. How do we help others uh, during times of climate uh, drought, local climate drought, for example? Uh, supporting development of groundwater conservation incentives for other shared groundwater users. Um, there's a number of different funding mechanisms. How do we, again, uh, help others use less water and have more shared wa water for all of our communities? Thinking about recycled water strategies, uh, treatment and management of recycled waters to support riparian systems, shallow groundwater recharge, we do need to prioritize um, further treatment of the recycled waters to remove a lot of the PFAS contamination. However, this is a great and excellent resource that could go uh, towards uh, enhancing these riparian areas, uh, mitigating some of the groundwater declines, et cetera. So I kind of left this last question of what policies do we want to see included referenced in the plan? There's a few already included. They do mention net zero or net blue. They do mention uh, creation of a stormwater utility. In a couple of years, they will be updating their drought response plan. Um, what do we want to get them to include in that plan? Integration of low impact development codes uh, that could get at some of the, that new development. And making it more sustainable. And this is our last slide, uh, and we'll share this link too, is how to submit your comments. 
there was a link shared at the very beginning. So it's just uh, on that, that next page, you can click to submit your own comments. We also encourage you to contact your elected representatives because they will uh, ultimately be adopting this plan. And so uh, if uh, they have, uh, they wanna hear from you on what you think. So I think we can open it up to comments, questions, discussion. Uh, we just wanna support you in, in writing your comments, anything you want clarification on. The floor is open. There is one comment, there is one comment that just popped up in the chat um, or question. Uh, do you have any suggestions for enhancing stormwater infiltration in shallow groundwater areas according to the ADWR? Uh, groundwater model for the Tucson Basin, about 50,000 AF of stormwater infiltrate in the shallow groundwater areas annually along with mountain basin interface. Individual rainwater harvesting efforts help, of course, but this is, but is there a relatively non-impactful way to increase that infiltration on a large scale? I'm giving that to Calo. <laughs> That's your <Yeah>. question. <laughs> I and I really apologize. I was trying to get some links in, so I'm not sure I fully heard it. Sorry. Nope. It's Dan's Basically, I, I I can do it. So uh, yeah. <laughs> so, ahead, um, so yeah, Catlo, uh, you know, looking at it, uh, granted, it hasn't been updated in a little while, but the most recent update to the ADWR groundwater models that they use for determining the availability of water for our hundred year assured supply and all that good stuff. Um, they say that along that mountain basin interface, we already typically recharge about 50,000 acre feet a year. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering, I know the county has been kind of talking about, you know, like very large swales or something like that to try to increase that infiltration. I'm just wondering, is there any suggestion you would have to put in the plan to try to in increase that recharge along that interface barrier or is, you know... Yeah. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question, Dan. And um, interestingly, the Santa Cruz Watershed Collaborative and the Watershed Restoration Plan gets at some of this and some of the potential strategies that could be deployed. Um, interestingly, we with climate change, we are have a diminishing snowpack each year that contributes to snowmelt runoff that helps to recharge mountain front and alluvial uh, recharge. So thinking about as we lose our snowpack, um, but we may still have more of that turns to rain, then we need to be even more proactive with uh, upland forest health and slowing and spreading that water as much as possible as it journeys down through our, um, down the mountains through our basin. So that means everything from on-site uh, passive water harvesting, especially in shallow groundwater mountain front areas to alluvial, um, arroyo restoration activities to forest health uh, restoration activities to fire, uh, post-fire treatments, um, especially after the Bighorn Fire, for example. And so then even as we then travel down through the community, thinking about floodplain preservation, restoration, floodplain connection, uh, because we're going to have larger, more intense storms, we need to be able to spread it out, slow it down, get it to infiltrate. When we did see a lot of large storm flows, that's when you do see uh, groundwater uh, rebounds in groundwater levels uh, following those flood events. So it's not a silver bullet, unfortunately, but it, it definitely takes an integrated holistic management approach from not just Tucson, but across all the different agencies and jurisdictions. And you said that was in the SCWC plan, which I'll admit I have not looked at yet. So I need to check that out as well. Um, yeah, but, and that's where a lot of the slides, we kind of summarized some of those main strategies that could be deployed. And so I look at it as how do we preserve that 50,000 acre feet of, storm, of uh, mountain front recharge? Because otherwise we may be losing it as we lose our snowpack. Right. Yeah, and that makes sense. And also just the, the floodplain protection, which you did bring up earlier. I'm not quite sure how we address that in the one water plan, just because that does come down to a zoning issue. And that's not something that, you know, Tucson Water is requiring the rest of mayor and council to act on that. And so I don't know how we include that. I'm, I'm not saying it's not a bad thing to put in there, but I'm just not sure how 
Tucson Water addresses that as part of the One Water Plan. Yeah, that's a good point. So One Water is an integrated planning framework. Um, any plan doesn't have teeth, right? But it sets priorities. So including it in a plan, referencing it in a plan gives some elected official or community member uh, the ability to uh, you know, build its case for taking action by a department, by an agency in the future. I think it can come in in the surface, like if we had a, a real extensive uh, chapter on surface flows that's local, not just Colorado River, like that's where floodplain protection and enhancement comes in really strong. So I think that it's just not a, a part of the plan currently. And so that's that really needs to change. And can I just add one more thing? It just came to me. I saw Joaquin's comments start at the top. Many communities are starting at the top and they're investing in the top. Uh, I believe Flagstaff, City of Denver have um, basically in, uh, investment programs for forest, upland forest health because that's what feeds our downstream aquifers or rivers. So we're the largest beneficiary of those mountains. How do we invest in them? Folks who are putting comments or questions in, feel free to raise your hand and you can unmute and share what you want to share. Anything for those of you who have looked at the plan, anything that really stood out to you or other areas that you're curious about, things you feel like are missing or things you feel like are well done? Just curious what you, you know, from your perspective, what are you seeing in this plan? Um, I think, little question. <laughs> Just for clarification, really, Lisa. Oops. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry. I'm so boring. Get the red book in there. Um, well, we're just looking at the creek while Catherine disappears into it. <laughs> she went off for a quick dip there. I, I do have one. I, I did see Kelly's comment and I kind of wanted to respond to that. And also, of course, I'd welcome Catlow or Lisa, if you'd like to respond as well. There have been recent changes to the city of Tucson's rainwater harvesting rebate program. It's actually some pretty significant changes. Um, personally, I think that it actually makes it a little easier for people to redeem, but it is definitely much harder to get your plan approved and prepare the plan and all that, which is probably an upfront stumbling block. But I do really like the approach they're taking at looking holistically at the entirety of the system and harvesting that first inch of rain instead of focusing entirely on putting in big tanks. And so I was just curious what your thoughts were as well. I don't, it's probably not really related to one water because I don't, I mean, they do talk about the incentive programs and everything, but they aren't specifically talking about the recent changes they made. I think to be determined, I think overall they're heading in the right direction, but in terms of how it's gonna play out on the ground and if it's easier or harder for people to submit the rebate, we'll see. But yeah, overall it's good for providing more funds for the passive water harvesting. I saw Joaquin's hand up for a little bit, but now it's done. Uh, this is this is Joaquin and thank you watershed management group Gato, Lisa everyone hello and mm -hmm. um, of course I'm at Pueblo Vida and and hopefully you can hear me correctly it's a lot of noise in here but one thing that stood up to me is uh, that is not in the plan I think is cities like Tucson we get it so easy I mean we're in floodplains we just wait for the water and we use it. I mean, we're bringing water from the Colorado. We're using the water from the Santa Cruz. And we just wait for it. 
So that connectivity between the origins of water, as Carlo was mentioning at the beginning, in the sense of how do we connect security of water from the origins of water, which are over mountains, over sky islands? What is that connectivity between Tucson water, Pima County, and Santa Cruz County in this case for the for the for the Santa Cruz River? We are working in Patagonia in green some infrastructure, in water harvesting, in restoration issues, but all that is with the thinking of water security uh, uh, for our communities, and uh, not only Tucson. It's, it's Patagonia, it's Tubac, it's Sierra Vista, it's, it's all those wonderful communities that are in the is out there, but it's just following the water, the origins of water, and what is it that we can do in terms of recharge, additional recharge water, use better stone water, infiltrate more water, but more on a holistic watershed approach. It's, it's not just the city. And that's what I don't see in the, in the plan. Uh, that's why I'd like to see the Catalinas in there, the Rincons in there, the perennial flow that we have. So we truly need to emphasize that. Yes. Because that's our security of water. Uh, and, and it originates in our mountains. Uh, so we need to make sure we're using, infiltrating, and elevating the role of the ecosystem services of those waters uh, for the benefit of our community and the, and the health of the watershed. So anyway, just taking that one water vision beyond the city of Tucson, because it has to happen, because that's where the water comes from. Anyway, yeah. I get I get excited with those things, <laughs> and and that would be my comment, I guess, on the mm -hmm. on the twenty one hundred plan, which is great that is there. I mean, it's kind of realistic that we're thinking as Tucson in that line. I mean, one hundred year of planning that's that's incredible. That's fantastic, but it can be better. <laughs> Thanks, Joaquin. Yeah, that's such a good point. I think this is. Tucson Water and partners are early on the path of a one water framework. And so us emphasizing that taking a watershed approach, understanding where our water comes from is so important. Um, so hopefully we can see that thinking evolve, especially as a lot of us speak up about the importance of that. I think Catherine is now back and then maybe Chris after Catherine. Catherine, are you good to speak? Uh, I can talk without <laughs> echoing. Um, oh, is that why you're walking away? Okay. I'm trying to not have it be echo. <laughs> Sorry, we I put my comment in the chat, Lisa. You're not echoing on my end. Oh, okay. Um, let's see. I was just trying to kind of say back what I was hearing from you, that it sounded like you're noticing that preservation and restoration of local waters is just kind of left out of the plan and that you'd like to see both specifically planned for. Am yeah. I getting that? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Whenever they talk about surface waters in the plan, they're talking about the Colorado River. They're not talking about local rivers. So it's really missing from the plan. Yeah. Yeah. Chris? Uh, just along those lines, when I read on uh, page 15, it says, you know, they talk about renewable Colorado River water. It just, it sort of sounds good and it's right up front, but that word, I think renewable is used over and over. So I think if the public reads that, they're going to think, oh, this is great renewable. That really, you know, stuck out to me. It's like using CAP, CAP this intensively for this long that doesn't seem like that should be the major plan here. So that's kind of what, the, and I, I was watching the uh, Water Resources Research Center uh, uh, talks today, and they did mention, oh yeah, and Tucson's great because we're looking into, you know, rainwater harvesting, et cetera. But it's kind of like this, you know, uh, footnote, I thought. So that, that stuff just kind of stuck out to me. Yeah, thanks, Chris. That sticks out to me too. I think it's a, a again a framework that Tucson Water and a lot of the cities operate that we now have a 
renewable source of water, and so now we're sustainable because we have this CAP water. But what does that mean for the Colorado River and the ecosystems it supports? Um, you know, what are the impacts of us using that Colorado River water? How sustainable and renewable is it from an energy perspective? So yeah, lots of questions there. Um, and I think that's good to poke at and not just assume that we all agree with that comment. So thank you. Others, things you noticed, things you wonder about? I'll just take a, a moment to quickly respond to Jennifer's comment about uh, information being gathered and not shared. Um, so that is, uh, has, there's been a, a very in, intentional initiative through the Santa Cruz Watershed Collaborative to better share across organizations and agencies. And um, so I'm really excited about that. We've been partnering a lot, sharing data from our Flow 365 program, uh, Sky Island Alliance's Spring Seeker program uh, to even wildlife connectivity. Um, but then even pairing that with, uh, you know, other agency uh, information from Forest Service to Tucson water for groundwater levels, et cetera. So uh, I'm really hope hopeful with the, the development of the Santa Cruz Watershed Collaborative and our ability to, or our growing uh, ability to collaborate. Can I make a comment about that? Oh, this is Jana. Um, so Catherine and I just went to the WRRC conference and one thing like <laughs> I'm so much more enjoying this talk today than that one because um, they hardly talked about any of these issues. It was like all for, you know, water for cities and, you know, um, and I guess the nature conservatory was the only one that even broached the subject of like water for rivers or restoration and i was wondering um if the santa cruz river collaborative or something maybe <laughs> would want to get involved in to do a presentation at that conference because there was a lot of people there and it just it, our views weren't represented well thanks jenna yeah, glad you and Catherine were there. <laughs> um, yeah, and actually WRRC, Water Resources Research Center, is one of the partners of SWAC, of the Santa Cruz Watershed Collaborative. So again, this is it's all very interesting. We're on a, a journey of change and sometimes two steps forward, one step back. I think we have Tucson Water, Water Resources Research Center, we have Pima County, you know, we have a lot of these partners in the collaborative and good things have come out of it. But I think kind of some nudging around, okay, let's let's move beyond talk to like really, really some having some integrated strategic actions together. Um, and these are plans and hopefully we can move beyond plans, but we do need to get we need to get the language, we need to get the concepts in these plans because it is, it is fundamental to a lot of the work that's going to happen. Uh, I have a question um, about the uh, any funding or the question of whether there's any funding going toward um, educating, encouraging, offering incentives to people to use less water because under it all, you know, you I mean, you talk about where the water comes from and how we're going to use it. But in truth, it's people use way more water than they need to because we treat it as if it's water and we wouldn't we wouldn't just uh let gasoline run down a drain or other mm. just things so uh, is there is there any sort of focus on that aspect just really getting to the public because i i, I find they're not they they don't know how to use less, which seems really. Um, yeah, Sally, good good comments. I think the plan does kind of they have demand management as a big piece of the plan. That is a big like the Tucson Water has a pretty robust conservation program. There's a conservation fee on the Tucson Water Bill. I think compared to most municip most utilities. 
uh, Tucson water is really strong in this area. Um, I'll just make a comment and see what Catlow has to say. And I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I think one of the disconnects are for people who aren't Tucson water customers. So the other water utilities, those folks with Metro water, um, for example, they don't have the same incentives that Tucson water customers have. They have pretty minimal incentives. We have people on wells who don't have any incentives. Um, so that's something WMG has been looking to address. Um, we've recently submitted a big grant to the state to fund a groundwater conservation incentives program for people who are on wells. So, you know, that may not be something Tucson Water may be directly feel they're responsible for, but it still should be showing up in their plan since this is an integrated plan. Yeah, and part of education. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts, questions? I'm curious how many of you participated in a previous aspect of this plan. Did anyone go to the town hall or fill out the survey? You've been involved in the process? Yeah, Jana and I were actually involved, oh, it must have been three to four years ago when they were actually doing some of those initial stakeholder meetings um, at the fire station downtown across from the convention center. And I did put a comment in there earlier. I don't know if you saw it. It was kind of frustrating because the contractor who was leading that, they, you know, they're trying to get a feel from all these stakeholders of what our approaches should be for trying to address one water. And, you know, of course, it was like very narrowly confined. It was kind of like, well, you have choice A, B, or C. And I'd kind of like be asking, well, what about choice D that's not on the wall? You know, and they, <laughs> it, it was really frustrating. And I think that kind of has been reflected in the plan somewhat, because it did feel like between the contractor and the Tucson Water leadership, they kind of had, you know, some of the desired answers in mind already. And so it was kind of steering towards that. Yeah. I think that's a good point. It's one of the points we were making too, that the priorities were set based on Tucson Water before they even got to the public survey. So we really would love to see as many comments as possible come in now on these topics, because if we get five or 10 or 20 comments, not sure that's gonna tip, you know, <laughs> tip this, but we really wanna see at least 100 River on Network members, community members, if you, friends, family, Whoever, get them to submit comments on this because if they get a bunch of comments about on these same topics, then hopefully they'll they'll change the plan. Um, so we really are trying to motivate people because this is our last this is our last entry point. So they need to hear from us. And yeah. comments are due by July twenty first. So get them our, in. Our um, committee, our Sustainable Tucson Water Committee, um, it we'll be working on a comment from our whole committee. Um, should we also like do individual comments as well? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Jennifer? Hi there, thanks for recognizing me. Um, so first time I guess commenter in like a public forum like this would be for me, would it be, more beneficial to be very bullet point straight to the point or more narrative does it really matter like is there a strategy to best get your opinions heard i that's a great question i think bullet points with page references would be good and that's where we pulled out a few of them for you on the slides with the surface water and groundwater but yeah i think some specific bullet points, it'll be easier for the person compiling. I think <laughs> Catlin, I know the person who's gonna be receiving a lot of these comments and you know, it might feel a lot for hopefully her to get hundreds of comments, but the more kind of succinct bullets with page references, I think would be more effective. Are you reaching out to the other environmental groups um, like at, that are in the Santa Cruz Collaborative, for instance? We haven't yet, that's a good suggestion. Um, I think maybe Lauren and I can work on sending this video on to some of our other partners, some of the other nonprofits, um, if they wanna share. So yeah, it's a good suggestion.
So there's a whole bunch of points there. Um, so when people are making their comments, um, should to different people work on different points or everybody do all the points or how would that, how would that work? <laughs> That's kind of up to you all. Catlow, you want to jump in? I, I mean, it can be very overwhelming as somebody who often is overwhelmed and commenting on plans that aren't in my own discipline. Um, so I would say the ones that speak most to you, um, but repetition is not bad. Uh, it just kind of helps reinforce that there's interest. Um, and who knows, maybe somebody says it slightly different that kind of breaks through the wall. Lauren, can you, or Catlow, actually, can you pull up the slide again, which I was like, if you don't get anything else out of the presentation, take, this is the take home slide. Can you pull that back up? Because I think if everyone on this call, plus a bunch more people like reiterate those points, that would go a long way. Um, so it's around surface water. Yeah, you were just on it. Surface water and groundwater. Nope, not that one. Slide 22, Atla. Nope. Sorry, I don't know which one you're talking about. Uh, overall recommendations, you were on it, that one. This one, okay. Yeah. So that, the first bullet there, add specific actions on how to protect and restore local surface waters like the Sabino, Tanka Verde, Retail, Santa Cruz, I would add to that Sienega Creek. Um, and then add actions to protect sensitive shallow groundwater areas that support our riparian ecosystems. So, I mean, that's, if everyone could reiterate those points, that would be fantastic. And if, however you wanna add on to that. Yeah, and I, I would definitely suggest not doing it verbatim, you know, because we, we've talked to, like Jana and I have both talked to our various reps, you know, from the city to the state to even federal, and they'll pretty much say, if I if we just get a bunch of form letters, we ignore it. Now, this is a little different, of course, because Tucson Water does have to actually look at all these comments and, you know, summarize them and figure out how they're going to address them or not. But yeah, definitely, if you say how that impacts you and put it in your own words, it definitely will have a bigger impact because it does show a lot of people are concerned about this. So I agree that it doesn't hurt to keep repeating the same things. If there's something that's really important to you, it doesn't matter that 10 other people, in fact, it's better that 10 other people say the same thing. Are you sending this um, to as an email afterwards or this? Can we share this with other people on social media? Yep. Yeah, the, this presentation is being recorded. And then um, I just copied and pasted the link to the presentation slides that Catlo sent in the chat earlier. So that link is in the chat for these presentation slides as well. So, but it'll be up on YouTube this evening, um, This the recording of this event. Catherine, do you have a question? You're muted. Okay, let me try this headset. There we go. That's the solution. Um, <laughs> I was just gonna say that, um, you know, I think um, Tucson has clearly demonstrated that it wants to move forward on climate and do a good job. It, the, the willingness is there. The heart is there. I think what they need from us is um, the push to go as radical as they would like to go. And I think, you know, some of the ideas that we're talking about here are beyond supply and demand, what water companies think about, right? Like we're really thinking about the environment, the health, the, the real concerns that we have about water and actually wanting an actual 100 year plan that takes everything into account. So I kind of feel like anywhere people feel passion, write about it, you know, let them know, give them what they need to be able to take the action they would actually like to take. <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. That's a great point.
Any final comments or questions? Can I make an announcement that doesn't relate to this, but relates to rainwater harvesting? Go for it. <laughs> okay, it's Jenna again. Um, so um, we have a campaign um, to share rainwater harvesting basins with the general public. And I'm trying to get this to reach outside of my little sustainability bubble. So really appreciate it if um, people could take pictures of their rainwater harvesting catchment basins and um, post them on their social media pages with the hashtag love my rain basin and whatever else they want to say, but at least hashtag love my rain basin. Cool. That sounds fun. We just need some rain and then we'll start taking those photos. <laughs> That's great, Jana. Well, thank you. Thank you everyone for joining. It, it really feels great to have you all show up tonight for your interest, for your observations and questions. We really appreciate it. Um, good luck with your comment writing. Uh, it is just an open box. So, you know, do what you can. Um, I think the important thing is to do something, right? Submit something and uh, we greatly appreciate it. Uh, I think Lauren will be following up with the, the links and everything. And if you wanna share your comments back with us, some people have done that, feel free to like pop it in an email, send it to Lauren. Um, yeah, and I would say you, we are always looking for now, how do we move things forward? And so new ideas, ideas from others, ideas from other communities are always interesting, intriguing, and thinking about how we can adapt them and move them forward. That's why I love that last question. What other policies, planning, can we, should we be doing? Any last words from you, Lauren? Are you good? No, I think we're good. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone. Have a good night. Have a good Thank evening. Thank you. Hope you have room in your inbox, Lauren. <laughs> yes. I do. <laughs> Lauren's right. eyes are bloodshot from reading the tome I sent. Lisa, can I ask you a question when everybody leaves? Sure. <laughs> I think I might, here, I can give Lisa. Um, can you stop the recording? Yes, that is also something I can do.